Um, at this moment uh, in this class, I think uh, you start getting a few. Essentially, you have all the important concepts in Azure and the programming. Saying that, well, how do you define a class? How do you syntactically uh, be able to create an object, be able to do something by the member function that you define? And furthermore, in the past, maybe three or four lecture, we went over uh, the concept of inheritance. Um, uh, with this, you are now have all the tool you need to create essentially a broad range of application under uh, object the program. Okay, so today we're going to talk about, well, how do you connect based on the tool that you have? How do you go ahead systematically be able to develop um, a medium size or large size project that using object in the paradigm. In fact, that is what object programming language was designed for you to very easily to create a large application. Um, so let me first ask you a question. Um, so we learned about inheritance. And even though at this moment, we just worry about single inheritance. So I'm going to ask you a question uh, before I start to look at this more detail. Is what is the usefulness about the mechanical inheritance in your opinion? So by the way, this has no single definite answer, but just Based on your impression, what you have learned the subject about inheritance so far, what do you think the inheritance is really designed for? That um, under what situation is useful and uh, for what purpose, for what advantage? Uh, and of course, there is a complexity related part, which we will also cover. But right now, I just wanted to think about the positive perspective on inheritance. What do you think that inheritance can can enable us or help us? Yes. Uh, one of you first. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> okay, look at the similarity about a bunch of objects. That's your error, right? Okay. Um, you also you can left write code and the code that you do like you know take the left node is all kind of there. Okay. Yeah. What's your name again? Emon. Emon? Emon. Emon. You see, I always have trouble to, to pronounce your name. Sorry about that. Okay. But but thank you for both of you. Um the two answer provided, in fact, looking at two different perspectives on inheritance, just just uh, I didn't talk to that earlier, but that, that was actually to answer in my mind. Uh, this one is about, uh, how do I say that? The concept of an object is quite new. So we saw some similarity about those objects and kind of represent uh, everything together. I mean, you should think about biology, right? Biology that uh, we can do, say, this is a uh, mammal, under mammal, we have. Different species, and in different species, we have other things. If you think about biology, essentially, biology provides us a what we call inheritance hierarchy because they kind of classify each species under a part of the tree, and such that you know every property you have at a lower level of the tree essentially should share the similarity or inheriting some property from the higher level. So we have used that concept in many things, uh, but the first uh, large scale application of inheritance is biology. So we, we can do a lot of things with um, this real life creature that we have, and how do we quickly understand, oh, this, this one belongs to mammals, so it should have 
so and so property and it should behave like this. Okay, so so that that provides us a very nice abstraction about the complicated world we try to deal with. Um, with that, what we call an inheritance hierarchy. Now we know what kind of things should be done. Of course, it's always have exception. By the way, all the this kind of classification similarity, they always have an exception. And unfortunately, just like biology in programming language, we also need to deal with exception. But most of the application is probably okay. Okay, so, so don't worry about exception at the beginning, but that's one part. But the other answer that was provided is essentially we can save the cost in software development. So instead of for me to write a bunch of code from scratch, what inheritance really provides from a software developer perspective is that I want to find a class with its code with both the .h and .cpp file that's closest to what I want. Then essentially the object of programming is just take that out and try to extend it derived by defining another class. And then I basically adding the difference between what I want to accomplish and what was already there in the inheritance hierarchy. So then I can deploy a first prototype in no time. So that, that is a power of our, uh, uh, inheritance supporting software development. Okay, so you can see that there's two, at least two perspectives. That's the most common perspective. One is related to your understanding how you model the complex uh, world with a nice hierarchy, just like biology, to help us understand what's going on in, in all the complication. But the other way is that we can really reusing code reusing the, the software that we already have and then extend it a little bit. We have to make some modification and we need to override some of the, uh, the behavior from the parent. Of course, you need to know which language you're using, either Java, Python, or C++. There are some tricks that you need to do when you try to inherit it, okay? Um, so those are the two important issues uh, we need to uh, uh, understand in order to use the uh, um, inheritance correctly. Um, but, but I do want to say that these two purposes in the short term, they sometimes might conflict with each other. They sometimes might conflict with each other. So, so that, that's the practical thing you need to deal with. Because if, if I want to design a large project with a lot of programmer, then I care more about a natural understanding about all the inheritance hierarchy. So I want to define an inheritance hierarchy that's consistent with a layman understanding about the world I try to model. But on the other hand, if I just want to have a uh, project due tomorrow morning and I want to show it to my boss, then essentially I might inherit a different class because I, I don't want to redefine, redesign a lot of things. And I just want to have a quick and dirty implementation and perform a demo. And maybe after that, after I've done that a few times, I realize, okay, this is what I really want. Then I switch back to the to the abstraction side, try to come up with a good implementation. So I, I just want to say that other the language provides two perspectives in the short term, you might need to decide what you want to do uh, regarding whether you want to do hacking or you want to do uh, a more clean slate design about inheritance hierarchy. Okay, so that, that's that's a practical stuff you need to deal with. So, so homework assignment number four, I really want to guide you through this process so we can see that from what we want until the, the, the tool or, or the representation we use and until we reach the final code that kind of represent what we want, okay? All right, so let me first talk about scenario. So a, a scenario is something which is 
a you can think about usually people say, hey, I want to build a system. I want you to build this uh, fantastic uh, uh, piece of software that is going to solve all the problem. Then, then my usually your first response is that, well, can you give me a scenario? So as a programmer, you can just say, hey, I want to build a system that can uh, help the food safety of our society. Oh, that sounds great, right? You want to build a system to do uh, food safety. And the, the, the natural response, as I show you example here, is I want a scenario about what kind of situation that you're dealing with, what kind of expected response we want from the software we're going to build. And from there, from the scenario, what you can abstract is the class and uh, the, the object, whatever you're supposed to write in your program. So we started with a scenario. Um, so this scenario, uh, maybe maybe I kind of make it up really, really fast. So let, let's see if it makes sense. By the way, you, you, can, you can make a suggestion about what we want to change. So, so assuming that a, a, a customer, he went to a Target-like uh, store, okay, to purchase something. So you can see here, he purchased two things. One is he purchased a box of beers and he purchased uh, a laptop, okay? So he purchased two things. Uh, one is a laptop, one is a, a, uh, a beer. And then of course, they he took it home, okay? After he took it home, he invited, a bunch of friends to have a nice evening celebrating that uh, uh, doing really well in for midterm number three. Okay, so uh, after that, he, he the next day he did his academic work on Saturday, I assume, uh, in TLC in this building, and then he was doing some work. But right at that moment, the Target like store realized that the the food product in this case is beer, has some issue. I don't want to speculate what kind of issue. Maybe somebody put some poison in there or maybe they, 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 they put the wrong ingredient for that particular food, okay? So now what they need to do is that they want to identify all the customer, not only all the customer who bought the product, but all the customer who consume the product. In this case, uh, we need to track not just the customer but also the friends who actually uh, uh, consume the product. So within uh, this maybe 12 hours, we need to, uh, if you still have the product, probably they still have a nine bottle of beer in, in that home that we need to actually allocate no more consumption about this the remaining box of the beer. That, that's number one. Number two, those three people who consumed last night or whatever, whenever they did that, they need to be number one identified, notified, and probably they need to be sent to the hospital uh, immediately for checkup or something like that. Okay, that, that's a scenario. Uh, that, that's, that's I, I said I want to, if somebody asks you to do a, a food safety system, you essentially have a piece of white paper you need to deal with. But the scenario helping us try to identify what kind of option, what kind of um, I call member function, for example, you need to start to coming out. So, so let, let's try to do some ex exercise. Just look at the scenario I described to you. Um, uh, what, what kind of uh, object you think we're dealing with? In this in this short scenario, what kind of object we need to have? I mean, when I say what kind of object, I really mean what kind of class we need to define. By the way, again, this is no definite answer because whenever I set is a design, a design, it usually has some trade off about what you want to model. I, I will actually discuss a few trade off immediately next slide, but I, right now I just want you to. To think about what, what kind of classes you think you need in order to represent this particular scenario. Yes, please. Class. You want to let, let me let me write it down. You want to have a 
Why am I doing? No, no, no. I cannot get out of here. Okay, sorry. I will write it down. I remember you understand what I'm what I'm saying. Okay. Uh, so we're saying that what kind of classes? So you said food, right? Is that good? It's a food class. Yeah. Person. Okay. Well, yes. Yeah. What? Store. Okay, store. Like a target, right? Okay. Anything else? All gray answer. Anybody? Yeah. Location. Okay. What else do you think we need? Yes. Employee. Okay. I will write employee. I will put the employee under person because it's a special type person, right? You see, I already have some kind of inheritance here. All right. By, by the way, store could be location, location could be store, but but we'll let's that's anything else. Yeah, please. Record, okay. You're talking about the record we did for early homework, right? Is that right? Okay. So, by the way, record is important because record is uh, is some kind of logging or tracing. Because once I've done a transaction, when Target Live sold a box beer to customer X. Okay, uh, by the way, we sh we're not worried about privacy at this moment, okay? Um, uh, by the way, there is a solution to deal with this, to still be able to trace without any privacy concerns. So, so you don't have to worry about, oh, uh, somebody actually know I bought a bottle of beer or something like that, okay? So, so there is a way to do the privacy, but when, we need to inform people for their safety that there is a protocol for us to, to get it. Okay, uh, so record is important because we need to keep track. So we not only need to keep track, by the way, not only the target like is on the track, they sold you a box of beer, but also when your friends come to your house, when your friends come to your house, they can shoot two bottles of beer. By the way, anyone you have a friend come to your house to, to drink your beer, or, or, or milk, or cereal, or something more serious? No? Wow, you guys are not so social. Okay, so so just just remember, after you take this course, you, you put a label in front of your refrigerator saying that any of you visit my apartment, your apartment, that if you take any food, you have to pull out the application and register yourself, saying that, okay, I consume, you know, half a gallon of milk or something like that, okay? It is crazy, it's for their safety, right? It's for their safety, okay. No, by the way, that's what Google has been working on for the past at least six years. They developed a smart fridge. If you, if you look at the timestamp about when the idea of smart fridge is at least six years, so they, they, can, they can track your refrigerator about what kind of food item was there. Because if you think about that, they collect all this information and they can actually sell the information to Target Life to say, hey, we believe that there are still about 200 million gallons of milk uh, unfinished in, in the Davis refrigerator. So you don't need to purchase more. Uh, because something like that is interesting uh, information. But the important thing is that if you have a smart fridge and then you build a facial recognition software, you will be able to trace down if your friend is sneaking in to steal one of your avocado uh, or something like that. Okay. So, so it's okay. So I remember I said I'm always respectful for privacy. All right. All right. You, you, you uh, please believe me. Okay. All right. So what what else should we should we have? What kind of other thing? Yeah, date, right? So it's a time. That's important, thank you, because it's important. If I want to trace, I have to know the time. Yes. Okay, price, all right. Well, it's probably not going to be too useful 
for the for the um, for this particular scenario, the prices might be important, right? If if somebody is instead of selling the the milk or beer, they're selling drugs or something like that. Okay, then, then that's important. Okay, by the way, law enforcement will be really interested if you can do this kind of tracing. Okay, say, so, oh, who actually consume this particular illegal drugs? And uh, you know, okay, price or maybe maybe how you pay for it, right? Okay. I didn't start it, you started, okay? Baron, you started, so it's how you pay for it. So I, 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 I sneak into checking your financial network and decide whether you, you, you have a laundry, some money or something like that. Okay, that's it. What else? There's one more thing I like to talk about is the time. The time actually have a multiple thing is time of purchase and also the time of what expiration, especially for some of the products, say milk or some of the stuff or meat, they tend to have, um, um, so to talk about meat, uh, I, I was involved in a project, which is quite interesting. We talk about tracing of the fluid. It has nothing to do with the application. We try to deal with this. We want to trace a cow or a chicken when they were born. Okay, we took a video and then we track where they are, just like what we did here, record. And then when you go to a restaurant in Davis, they serve you the, 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 the steak or serve you the, the, the whatever the chicken dish. And then they will actually play all the video about how the chicken grow up in their lifetime. <laughs> And, and, and I, I thought that was that will that will be really positive for you to enjoy your meal. Okay. Anyway, all right. So so there is a lot of interesting application. By the way, that that idea was uh, from a few a couple years ago. There there was one uh, ECS thirty six B student. They actually talk about how they can be positive. To to uh, to show some video about the history about how you receive this food when you were consuming. I mean, it's not trying to try to make you uh, feel bad or guilty, but instead to tell you the reality about how this food you're consuming, what process, how much water you waste, how much electricity, and what's the process to to appreciate more about the whole preparation process. So that, that was one of the ideas. Okay, but we'll get down to homework four, which we'll only worry about tracing at this moment. Okay, all right. So I want to first show you the class hierarchy. So this is just, I'm gonna show you this slide. This slide is not a, uh, I will give you a source code that's representing this particular hierarchy. So there, there are two things I want to tell you. Is the first I want to kind of capture some of the idea that you presented. I'm not capture everything. Uh, but the second thing is I want to introduce you the term. Uh, you probably heard me saying this, but you until now you see why it is. This is called inheritance hierarchy. So inheritance hierarchy, we have three things. One is called inheritance hierarchy. One is called containment hierarchy. One is called communication diagram. All right, so, so there are different formality to represent your design. But this is just one example. I I personally feel this is simple. I don't need a complicated tool. I can just draw it on the piece of white paper or the whiteboard to talk to other people. So, so let's first talk about what is inheritance hierarchy. So inheritance hierarchy has only two purposes. Purpose number one, I want to include every single class. I'm going to implement on this sheet of paper. So essentially, uh, let, let's take a look at this. Over here, I have a nine different classes. So I designed nine different classes, and those are all the classes I will need to handle that. That's number one. Number two, I want to also provide What's the relationship among those class? Meaning inheritance. So that's why it's called inheritance hierarchy. So essentially you can see that, okay, I have 
uh, two classes. One is label GPS and GPS. I probably don't need label GPS, but since we have it, I just include it. Okay, so so there is an inheritance hierarchy there, and record is very important because I need to do logging. And record at this moment, at least at this moment, I don't see a need for doing any um, subclasses. So that's that's just fine. Um, so so just let you know. Um, Uh, inheritance sometimes if you don't need to use it, don't force yourself to do it. Okay, sometimes it's perfectly fine if your design is not a single beautiful uh, inheritance hierarchy, but instead you have multiple tree. You, you have a small tree, a big tree, and sometimes you have a singleton. That's perfectly okay. And then you can grow. By the way, you can grow. If you build this tree, you want to modify. Think about this. If you learn inheritance, if you have this tree. And say tomorrow you meet with your colleagues and you decide to have a different kind of record, different kind of functionality. Um, you can modify the record, the original client, or you can just use inheritance to do another one. So this is not usually a final design, but in the process to help us to understand what we need. All right. Um, and we have um we have a thing, and the thing I essentially have a uh, inheritance looks like this. Thing is the original thing. And then I have something I call expiration because I want to, there, there are some of the thing I don't care whether they will expire, but some of the thing is important. Uh, I, I, need to, I need to include attribute as well as member function to track whether this particular foo is already expired. Or it has some kind of validation period. Okay, and then I also have another class. I call it consumable. So um, the, the difference is that some of the items, if you see that, for example, I, I, I purchased, this is just like the food item uh, you mentioned earlier. Uh, what's your name? Victoria. Victoria mentioned about food. So this is I kind of using consumable. Uh, so, um, um, and there was some item like a laptop. It's a thing, but nobody will consume. It is only have the new laptop, and when we decide, is it's done, and then we throw it away. It's in the process of beginning at the end. It doesn't have a a kind of reduction about its amount or its content. Okay, so consumable means that it it could be a food. It could be a box of a diaper or something like that. It means that you're going to use uh, some part of that over the lifetime. Okay, so that that's that's three classes I define. So you have an inheritance hierarchy looks like this, and you have a record, and then I have a person and the an agent. So um, I think one of you say something like a store, right? You want to have a store to represent uh, the, the market. So over here, I kind of want to simplify. I don't want to go into a topic like, uh, at least for this homework, I don't want to go into the, 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 um, the, top, the, the, the topic such as the store or storage or refrigerator, those kind of concepts. I think it it's has some benefit, but right now for me to handle that scenario, I don't need to worry about more detail about uh, the, the um, the, the target store. Instead, I have a special kind of person I call agent. So agent is a person, but it's a representative of a business or some kind of business who actually conduct the transaction. Okay, so, so you can think about that agent is just a representation. And the only things, the difference between person and the agent is that the agent has a function to do recall. Okay, a general person, they cannot do a general recall, but the agent is the one that can represent the store and also can handle the recall as well, okay? And then of course we have JV time. So if you come back to look at, sorry, look at what you described here, do we kind of more or less cover everything except the price? Probably, right? I mean, the, you can see that there are some similarity is not exactly the same. And by the way, 
I'm not saying which one which one is better. In my opinion, this is probably better than the, the next slide, okay? And uh, by the way, when you do homework assignment number four, uh, I will give you a all the inheritance hierarchy, containment hierarchy, and communication chart. And then I give you the, the key, which is how that chart leads to the interpretation of every single class. But when you try to develop this, you can certainly use this as base, but you can also extend. You can design everything from the scratch. As long as you have something that's actually can handle this part. Okay. All right. So this is the basic class. Uh, from here, you kind of know what's the class that you need to deal with. Okay, so now every of this class, they need to have some functionality. So functionality meaning that number one, I have to define certain attribute and I have to define certain member function for me to realize the interaction among objects. So, okay, let me actually tell you one thing. So far in this class, we kind of focus on uh, object kind of isolated. The only thing we did is that we create a person or create a GPS or create a thing, or we create a record. But all of this is kind of static in the sense I just shuffle information into this object and then I call the dump to JSON for, for me to print what is the content of the object. But now we're going to extend it to say, well, the object is not stand alone. In fact, in a realistic object-oriented system, you have a lot of objects and they are interacting with each other. You think about in this room, we have about 100, right now we probably have one to 10 person object. And the thing is that we are, if you think about that, for, for an object programmer like me, I, I see everything as an object, okay? And everything is object-oriented. So, so unfortunately, that's my, my view about life as well. So I have a 110-person object in this room, and there's a lot of functionality. You guys are interacting with each other. You're sending each other email. You're, you're, you're looking at the other person and wondering what they're doing and you try to raise some help, uh, to get some help to solve one of the issue. So there is a lot of interesting interaction about the object in this world. And in object programming, it's not just about isolated object and try to print out what it has. It's really about interacting. That's why I'm going to show you uh, next. So in order to do that, we now have to look at a few functionality we need to include in those attribute and also in those member function that enable object to interact with each other. Okay, let, let's look at this. So I list five things. I think these five things are sufficient to represent the scenario that we describe here. It might not be the best five things, but it's the five things should be sufficient for me to represent the scenario. So the first thing is I try to capture what I call the possession relationship. Possession relationship is essentially saying that at certain time a person is possessed a particular thing at a particular location, all right? So, so think about a transaction. Um, so for example, a transaction um, I bought, a box of beer from Target Lab. Um, and uh, before I bought this, Target Lab has an agent. Remember, I said Target Lab, I don't want to model the store, but what I model is an agent. So Target Lab has an agent. They represent the store manager, uh, in particular over there. And the thing is, before I bought it, the possession was with him. So you will have a record saying that this product, the box of beer and the agent uh, at certain time is actually possessed this product. That means the store has it. 
So a, a transaction, when we try to bond a beer, that, that essentially uh, represents two functionality here. Sorry, the first functionality is possession. Now I possess that because I'm the customer, I bought a beer, but also there is a detachment. The detachment is a special, sorry, it's a special kind of relationship to, to close the record, mean, meaning that I no longer own that particular product. Okay, so so that that's the detachment. But let let me let me let me actually go go over here. There is a, also another kind of possession I call updated possession. Updated possession is uh, is what do I call it? Is um, for example, uh, we have uh, uh, in this example I said, well, you bought a bottle of milk. Uh, and then you consume 50%, or you bought, you bought a bottle of beer, 12 bottles, and you finish three bottles. So essentially, it's the same possession record. It's the same possession record, but the thing perspective is going to be consumable. And that consumable is going to reduce to whatever content related to what you possess. Okay, and the rest of that is essentially being uh, being uh, get rid of from the record. Okay, so that's the first thing: possession and the update possession. Okay, and the other thing is uh, uh, check in. So after you possess something, and sometimes you need to move this stuff to somewhere else at certain time. So you need to do a, a, a check in, uh, but it's still the same record, but then you just keep updating where you have that. Okay, by the way, I have a, I have a, um, I have a logging functionality. When I say I change, it doesn't mean that I remove the record. I said, there is a capability called logging that every changes in the record will be logged. So every single touches of here regarding you change the time, change the location, change the content, it will be recorded. So I have all the data, why I need all the data so I can look at the data to help me to identify who has been affected when I realize that the food need to be recalled. Okay, so just clarify that. So what is the check-in? Does check-in just update the time and location? For example, uh, the customer uh, brought a computer from home to TLC to do some work here. So the thing is you need to do that kind of update. And detachment is essentially a special kind of check-in and saying that this record is done. For example, uh, the, the detachment could be, oh, this one I already finished. I finished 100%, this product is gone. Okay, that's the last record. It should be gone. Or target light sold the stuff to you. Target light no longer have that. So they basically will 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 finish that record. By the way, if somebody return, somebody return the, the product, say you bought a uh, laptop, you, you realize this laptop has feedback, you need to return to uh, target light. And the target light will essentially create another record and then that record represent another possession okay that that's the model issue whether you you want to associate with a previous record you own or you want to create a new record that's 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 the the choice of the design but uh, in my experience to create a new record under this scenario might be simpler to implement okay and then this important thing is called co-ownership Ownership is a function saying that, okay, uh, I have a box of beer in my refrigerator. Now I invite two friends come to my house, say, let's have some uh, fun time. We watch TV or whatever uh, activity, and then we enjoy, share some drink. And, and therefore, at that time, that's why I'm saying that your, your smartphone needs to install this application. And such that you create a co-ownership means that at this moment, this two extra friends become the co-owner of this product. So in the record, we can actually, so it's just try to represent who actually consumed the product together. So the co-owner could be your friend, could be your family member or whatever, have access to your, your items over there. Okay, co-ownership. But usually we want to keep the identity to the original ownership as well, because the assumption is original owner will be able to control the remaining product. Okay, so that that's the this is a functionality that's actually 
cover everything. So I kind of turning this into a bunch of classes and bunch of uh, functionality I would like to implement in the object programming. Okay. All right, the next thing is a containment hierarchy. So, so just to let you know, inheritance hierarchy focus on the relationship around all the classes that you need. Containment hierarchy focus on one particular class at a time. And I try to focus on what's the content of that class. So in this case, I'm just showing you uh, the example of expiration class. So expiration class, uh, is a class that inherit. Oh, but by the way, you see here, I didn't represent inheritance relationship because why you can look at your, your inheritance relationship too. And then from that inheritance relationship, you can look at the containment hierarchy for my uh, uh, base class as well. So I'm not going to repeat any information that's not needed. So what I did is just the extra Attribute, in this case, I add a two attribute. One is the expiration time. When you buy a product, what is the expiration time? And the other one is, could be more complicated, but right now I'm just using a screen to represent, at least for this quarter. So what is the environment? Meaning that, are you storing this product in the right environment? If you buy, a computer, are you uh, putting in the right kind of protection? If you buy some kind of plan, you actually put it in the right spot for, for, for that plan to grow well. Or if you buy a, a product that like ice cream, uh, did you actually put it into a freezer? Something like that. So the environment is help us to be able to identify whether you have to put it there. And that, that is important, especially if you want to design eventually to a smart home kind of uh, scenario. So you have a one function that's very, very simple. A function, a member function to that is just check the storage condition to check whether this particular product, based on the environment specified, whether the location of the product is actually consistent with that environmental recommendation. Okay, that is, that is, oh, by the way, is this complicated? Very complicated. Does it need hardware sensor? It need all kinds of hardware sensor. But for object programming, you can write very simple code. Just pretend the hardware is there, whatever is there, and then you gradually grow. This is, by the way, uh, I don't want you to uh, miss this point. Object programming, is a really nice tool to help you to develop a really free, 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 free prototype of the things you really want to build. And you can just using some very simple printf statement or some very simple logic to highlight what you think that this particular end product should look like and what kind of functionality it should have. The purpose is for you to build a demo that you will be able to demonstrate your innovation. And then when people see the whole systematic idea, then we gradually focus on this, try to uh, realize that. Okay. Oh, I've got one minute, so I have to finish this slide. So this is an example of a communication chart. As I said earlier, I said, okay, I define attribute, I define member function, I have objects, but how they're going to connect with each other. This is what the um, uh, communication chart is, is provided. It's intended to clarify under what scenario, what situation that this particular functionality or member function or attribute should be used in this example. Let me, let me just show you this. So, uh, over here, I simplify a little bit. So I have a four object. I have a, I have a, a, a target light, which is an agent, by the way. And then I have a box of beer, which is a consumable. And then we have a two other person, customer and his friend. And think about the first thing we did is that at some point you have a possession record. So essentially you use possession functionality to create a record. And possession record saying that the target light possess this. But then at, at some point when the customer bought the beer, 
you simultaneously have a two functionality. One is detachment, one is a new possession because this is the transfer over here. So you can see that here, I, I purposely want to create a separate record because if I still need to keep that possession when somebody returns, it, it makes this, this particular chart will be a lot more messy. Okay, so I'm trying to, usually I try to make a separate, it's cleaner. So once you have a possession, now I create the ownership, co-ownership. So when I create the co-ownership uh, to include his friend, in fact, I, I forgot one arrow, the arrow because co-ownership will be related to box of beer as well. Okay, that functionality help a new user being added to the, uh, the, the, the consumable box of beer. And then after that, you can have the update. The update essentially is saying that these two people consume. When you consume is another two record that's being created. So essentially every single call has at least one record being recorded, being logged. And then eventually this target line is going to issue a re uh, recall of the product. When this is the recall, the output is a list of person and the list of the partial product is still available. And also it will provide where is a user. For example, if you remember the last scenario, when this was recalled, the customer is in TLC. So essentially we not only want to identify who that person is, we want to know where he is so we can send our ambulance to help a potential uh, uh, case over there. Okay, so I'm going to stop here and we will continue this on Monday. Mm -hmm.